Well, hello, I'm Lori LeBay, and I am the founder of Alzheimer's Speaks. And I switched careers about 10 years ago uh, due to my mother living with dementia for 30 years. And I was a frustrated daughter who wanted to change the world and how we dealt with dementia. And so I developed Alzheimer's Speaks to raise everyone's voice, those living with the disease, families, professionals, researchers, entertainers, anyone and anyone who is involved and or has a service product, tool, or story to tell. And I'm proud today to introduce you to Bob Savage. Bob is living with dementia and he has done miraculous things uh, during his time period. And today he's going to tell his story. I've had the honor of knowing Bob through Alzheimer's Speaks Radio and also Dementia Chats, which are video interviews uh, where I facilitate a panel of people with dementia and they give us great insights. And I know you're going to enjoy this video as you hear Bob's story. Hi, my name is Bob Savage. I received my first diagnosis of having Alzheimer's on March 15th, 2015. I will share two parts of my story. First, I will tell you the negative aspect that started immediately following my diagnosis. Second, I will share how it's possible with appropriate support and training to turn this very negative experience to that of a positive one. For it started six years ago when my wife noticed that I was starting to forget things more than usual. With some effort, she finally convinced me that we should make an appointment with a gerontologist to determine what was going on. We went to a number of appointments. They would test me, then send us home saying to come back in six months. Then following a much later visit, we returned home and I found my wife crying. I asked her why she was crying and she replied, did you hear the doctor say that you have Alzheimer's? I immediately went into denial. Eventually, however, we decided to go to the Hartford Hospital Memory Care Unit headed by Dr. Karen Blank for another diagnosis. She, after missing a three hour test, told me that my diagnosis was vascular deterioration along with early stages of Alzheimer's. I was now forced to accept the fact that I was now living with that diagnosis and had to learn how to deal with the consequences. We started the very, the very difficult process of seeing a lawyer, putting our assets in order, revising my will, stipulating my end of life request and turning my portion all of, of all my assets over to her. Although I trusted her, I walked out of that lawyer's office owning nothing and feeling the loss of what I worked so hard for my whole life. I found it difficult to accept this, yet knowing that I eventually would not have enough cognitive ability to express my wishes in the future. I want to let you know what it was like those days. My life changed immediately, which is, which is definitely something I did not want to brag about. Many people, after receiving a diagnosis, do not want to let others know about their diagnosis and try to keep it quiet. Because no one goes around saying, guess what folks, I've been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, yahoo. This meant I had to accept the fact that I had a disease of the brain that would steadily eat away at my cognitive abilities. Yet, I must continue to remind myself that I still have many of my cognitive abilities and must do everything in my power to keep them for as long as possible. I now make every effort to live this concept one day at a time. Sure, living with cognitive changes present me with many challenges, but that does not mean that my life is terrible. I still know that I have much to offer and it's important to me that you appreciate that when we interact with each other. Yes, the early days were difficult times that, they, that would not go away. They were confusing and painful. Alzheimer's, FTD, or whatever diagnosis you have turns your life 
upside down. One day you're feeling you're at the top of your game and then it's gone. You want answers, but at the same time, you really don't want to know what they will be. One day, while in a grocery store, everything went dark. And finally, some light appeared and I was able to leave the store and drive home. I was awake all night knowing that if I told anyone about this, I would have to give up my license to drive. Finally, I asked myself, suppose this had happened while I was driving at 80 miles an hour on a major highway. I could have killed many others and myself as well. The next morning, with much hesitation, I told my wife how I felt and I decided to give up my car license. Having to give up my license for me was even worse than receiving my diagnosis. So I gave my car to one of my daughters who loved the car as much as I did. She drove me to the motor vehicles department. I turned my license card over to an employee and while looking very bored, she gave me a card that looked just like my license, but now it was only an ID. That moment I will never forget. Now I was homebound, completely dependent on my wife or friends for anything that I needed to do outside of my home. No Uber available at that time. No longer was I able to sneak out and get that good beer. Yes, those were very scary times for both my wife and I. So, my dear Mr. Alzheimer's, I denied you an exist that you existed for a long time, the big A. After a while, I could no longer deny you. I definitely did not want to meet you as I went into the darkness, feeling all alone. The dark cloud, dark cloud is still here today. I still have difficult nightmares, knowing that they will return like a loud sound of a train rushing along its tracks. The words of memories come slower, not at all. This disease has a way of silencing us as the tangles and plaques continue to eat away at different parts of our brain at a steady and uncertain pace. I learned that I was not the only one who was changing. Dementia has a way of changing the people around us as well. We have family members, friends, familiar healthcare professionals who now treat us very differently. I've heard stories from others facing the same experience that really warm our hearts and others that make you cry. This experience has proven to me the importance of having compassion for those of us who are living with dementia. Was then I decided to do everything in my power to work towards reducing the heavy stigma that society places on us that has been this way worldwide since the early 1800s. First six months were very difficult as, and I spiraled down into a deep, dark depression. Seriously thinking of committing suicide as I did not want to spend the last years of my life living in one of those nursing homes. I ordered and received a book of information how I could order a drug from drug Mexico to use and how to commit suicide. I started looking into the legal issues on suicide in Connecticut and learned that if my wife were to help me in any way, she would be convicted as a murderer. So that was not an alternative. My wife and I continued to share our serious depression. It was not the usual depression as described in medical terms. It was the fear of what we would be giving up and who I will eventually become. My fear and my wife's fear, I would lose my ability to care for myself and I eventually end up in that nursing home. At that time, I was 85, recently retired, in excellent health. And I could then really end up living that nursing home for a number of very long and scary years. I started more, studying more about dementia and related issues online. My wife started attending support groups and we kept up with our friends, attended entertainment events, all helping us to keep focused on our day-to-day -day living. I attended a support group sponsored by the Alzheimer's Association that I felt to be helpful. In addition, they sponsored museum tours held at St. Jones University and the Matatech Museum. I spent 
more time with my family and grandchildren and having lunch with them on a regular basis. As I stated earlier, my first six months with dementia was very difficult for me. I withdrew from most activities and was very reserved in those I did participate. After a while, my Alzheimer's team encouraged me to continue to participate in support groups where I could be honest about my concerns and learn from other support groups. I also decided to be honest with my friends and others that I did have Alzheimer's. During my breakfast visits, I would ask them <clears throat> to be honest and let me know if they see any changes they saw from the previous time I was with them. This helped us to have an even closer relationship. This experience also taught me to maintain that same honest relationship with other people. And as a result, they would feel more comfortable when spending time with me and I with them. Slowly, I started to accept my life that would now be steadily changing, and at some point in the future, I would no longer be able to do the many things that I currently could do. Now, the thoughts of ending up in that nursing home, where we move our elderly out of our societal mainstream, where one will be required to give up our independence and live under the restrictive governmental regulations that usually lessen not encourage an individual's ability to remain independent. Losing my independence was definitely something that I did not want to experience. My wife felt the same way. We both started falling apart, thinking about having to live in the future under that dark dementia cloud. Our friends and family started seeing me in a different way. They started speaking to me slower. They were very hesitant to talk to me. They would speak mostly to my wife, who look at me with that worried look and talk to me in an awkward way and seem very overly concerned. It was at that point when I started to realize that the Bob Savage I knew as being fairly normal was now seen as that demented Bob Savage. This was very hard for me to accept, as I personally felt I had not changed that much. My wife and I were doing our best to keep up beat, but the strain and fear of the future caused by this stigma was having also placing a heavy burden on us, and we felt at times it was just too much to handle. So, with some support from my support group members, I started looking at my positive ability that helped me in the past to determine what could work for me now and help to cope with my dementia. I generally grant, grant, learn the importance of being involved with persons living with dementia, where we could share ideas of how to cope and to meet our mutual challenges. I've discovered that we are our own best teachers by sharing our stories and finding these new ways to cope. We work together, finding our power of creativity, power of living in the present moment, our strength in our spirituality, all this to develop our strong new sense of purpose. My dark clouds will always be there. I will continue to have nightmares like a train coming down the track, and I will continue to work as hard, hard as I can to help reduce the stigma that we all face. I started participating in museum tours, sponsored by the Connecticut Alzheimer's Association located the St. Joseph Art Gallery in West Hartford, Connecticut, and the Manitoc Museum located in Waterbury, Connecticut. They offered tours of the latest art that was led and commented upon by knowledgeable and engaging museum curators. Most of what was presented was abstract painting from artists from all over the world. I started writing poems at each visit, describing my impression of the art to help me remember and appreciate that experience. I would read my poem at the next visit of our group members and was eventually named by the group, the Poet Laureate of the I Don't Remember Club. I wrote six poems reflecting my impressions during six different visits. My first poem was about my reaction to one of Don Gummer's wall sculpture that was about three by five feet in dimension. This is it. 
right there. The interior contained approximately 100 or so dark colored sticks, a foot long, one to three inches in width, and were placed in many directions. I jokingly stood underneath this sculpture and pointing up to the sculpture I mentioned to our group, hey, this could be my brain as a mesh. And suppose if any one of my thoughts could try to get in, and if so, would I ever be able to recover it? <laughs> that got a few laughs. So I wrote a poem. We are born with a miraculous brain, which script on its own with steady gain. We take it for granted as we grow, like it operates consistently like ducks in a row. One day it's slowed by tangles and plaques, which eventually cause my memory to wrangle. John Gummer's sculpture called Pentagon Three, it picks for me what my brain will eventually be. During the next visits, we were shown a collection of abstract art. I would immediately look for another mesh to feed my depression. And then if nothing showed up, I would join the group viewing the art and sharing our comments. And I would return to the museum the next day to study the art that piqued my interest. One painting was on an eight and a half by 11 white page of paper with just red and black words in no particular order named the photocopy. Seeing this mix of the red and black color, colors, words, started me thinking of the power of colors to use to express emotions in my abstract art. I then started to seriously study on lean, online how the power of each color and the size of a brush stroke helped me to show my emotions on my abstract art. The Matatuck Museum on each visit would provide lunch followed by a basic one hour art class. I still refer to those techniques that I learned there as I paint today. From that point on, my interest was primarily devoted to abstract painting and much less to writing poetry. My wife helped me set up a room in our house where I could freely paint. I took advantage of every opportunity available to me to experiment in painting abstract art. One of the museum art teachers referred me to Blix art store close by. I met young aspiring artists working there with various levels of art painting experience. When I needed help, I would go to the store and one or two staff would help me by suggesting colors and brushes that I could use for impact. I would turn later to show them what I was working on and they would offer more helpful hints. They also encouraged me to study colors online learn emotions related to each shade of each color which expressed my emotions on each painting. Later, when I entered the store, they would recognize me and help me in many ways. Unfortunately, I can no longer visit the store. However, I order all my art supplies from the Blick warehouse. I now have painted over 30 abstract paintings on different sizes of canvases that help reflect the different stages of my dimensions progress, reminding how far I have come. They are all hang up on the walls of my room, helping to make my room much more colorful. And here I'd like to show some of my paintings. This is a painting that I call the Alzheimer River. You can see that up in the upper left hand corner is a lake that has fairly light water and the, no, it had muddy water and the water coming from the lake and a stream went down into the valley and into the river, making it more muddy. Then later on down the stream, you see a, another stream coming in with fresh mountain water, freshening the water in the river. And this goes on down through the valley. And, and then finally, at the very end, you see the lake again, all light. And showing that the clear water overpowered the muddy water. This is an example for me on how 
if we continue to work and make these new, rebuild new cells, that our brain will stay clearer much longer. The other one, the other one of my favorite paintings is this one. And it's called uh, Resilience. You can see on the left there is a story of my life going through prior, you know, during the early stages of Alzheimer's and then going down into our depression. And that down there was very scary, very scary. But eventually I started to spend more time with my family and grandchildren and painting. And as I did more and more, you can see how the, the colors started to lighten up and kept moving and moving towards the next painting that I have. This painting is called The Storm. I was, uh, I was uh, inspired by a poem written by uh, Louisa May Alcott saying, I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid of, of storms because I'm learning how to sail my ship. And you can see there that I had a lot of fun making lightning bolts. And, and you see a little further, what happened to my ship? Oh, there's my ship right there. <laughs> and underneath it, it has, is uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Louisa May Alcott's quote, I'm not afraid of my storm because I'm learning. And that really says where I was at that point. And so, so that was the first three of my paintings. They're still my favorite. During this period of time, my relationship with my wife was seriously being challenged. We decided I should go live with my brother in Massachusetts for a while and see if things could cool down. I brought all of my painting supplies, made the necessary adjustments to my room so I could continue to paint. One night, I had that inspirational dream of a river, and I just showed you that picture, that painting that I made as a result of that dream. The water in the lake was rough with dark brown caps, showing the lake was muddied with dirt and debris. Streams entering the river, carrying the same dark and muddied water from the lake. The second stream was carrying fresh, clean water from the mountains above and thereby lightening the color of the water in the river. Eventually, further down the valley, there were only streams flowing with fresh, clear water. One can see the lake located lower in the valley, receiving all the clean water and is now bright blue, clean, and showing waves with white caps. The message I learned from that painting, I named the Alzheimer River, was that my brain could be represented by the muddy lake. And if I were just to give up and sit around all day doing nothing constructive, could have my tangles and plaques would have a heyday, eating away the white cells located in different parts of my brain. So now I take every opportunity to keep taking risks, experimenting with new projects. And I wrote a poem with the Alzheimer, uh, attached to the Alzheimer River painting. We now have our tangles and plaques, been growing for years and years. Now fighting those tangles and plaques, by enjoying my life as never before. I love my family, friends, poetry, music, art, creativity, nature, and much more. All this to keep ahead of those damn plaques and tangles. Our new arts, white cells will outwit I'll wit those P's and T's. They will. I know they will. Yes, oh yes. Uh -huh, uh -huh. From that point on, I can do to make every opportunity to stay active. Yes, oh yes. I'll cre keep creating those new white cells and keep ahead of those damn tangles and plaques and fall, allow my brain to continue to provide the information I need to function on a daily basis as long as possible. After three months or so, my brother decided I should return home, but he returned to the full privacy of his home. When I asked him why, he suddenly lost his temper 
saying rather loudly that it was his home and that he could do anything he wanted and wanted me out of the house immediately. And he left the house. So I started packing my things to my car and decided that I would move to a motel close by until I figured out where I could go live now. When he returned, I was still packing. He apologized and said there was no longer a hurry for me to leave. He did stress leave. I think the reason he wanted me to leave was that a few years earlier, he took full care of his wife, who lived with Alzheimer's for five years until she died at home, which was very stressful and difficult for him. And I think he was afraid that I would eventually end up the same way and that he would have to take care of me. Eventually, we were able to return to our early relationship to where it was previously. So I called my wife, telling me I had to return home. She agreed, and I left the next day. Shortly, I returned to the Alzheimer's Association to participate in my support groups for persons living with dementia. I found it a relief to be able to associate once again with other people living well with dementia, where we had the opportunity to share our challenges as well as our positive experience. My wife continued to attend her support groups for partners living with dementia. So this is a uh, this is a, one of my favorite poems that I wrote uh, at the uh, following a visit at the Mattituck Museum, September 17th, 2015. Prints were by Albrecht Durer and Rembrandt's titled The Veneration of Christ. All prints were powerful, shown the talents of both artists. Most prints, prints emphasize the suffering of Christ during and after his crucifixion. Following the viewing of the prints, I felt sad and wished that the prints focused more on the wonderful works of Christ prior to and following his lifetime. The art was not very lifting for care partners and persons living with dementia disease. We did, however, appreciate the intricacies and carefully crafted works of art. Below is an on writing poem that describing a part of our <coughs> experience that day. Please note that Jennifer is a person that would fairly advance dementia. I call the poem Jennifer's Day. Judy, our leader, presented a brief background of Dura's family. She mentioned that his mother had 18 children. Jennifer responded loudly, you go, woman. The group broke out in laughter and appreciation. Judy then said that 15 of her children died at birth. Junior again responded, that's awful. Another loud and appreciative response from the group. People walking by who knew we were a dementia group wondered how we could be laughing and responding so loudly. Because we can, yes we can, we sure can. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Medita. During another visit, I entered the gallery and after coffee and treats, the curator provided us with opportunities to review six abstracts starting by presenting artists. Twelve chairs were placed in front of the paintings. The curator provided us information about the artists and then led a discussion to share what we saw in the paintings. At first, all were hesitant to share what they saw and felt. Gradually, one or two took the risk of sharing as to what they saw. In a few minutes, more members started sharing. There was laughing, crying, wise remarks, but most meaningful was most members of our group participated. The value of this process showed that we can have all our interpretations on any topic that relates to our life experience. Our experience of sharing our group process plays a key role in making this positive, in making this positive experience as well. During this time, I attended a workshop led by a woman living with well dementia, where we shared examples of what we're doing to help meet our new challenges. She stressed that all that we identified was very important. But what was even more important was that we develop a new, strongest sense of purpose under which all would follow. This became my primary goal. My new sense of purpose is that I will do everything I can to live a more positive life, attend meaningful training events, meet regularly with friends, 
spend quality time with my family, my 10 grandchildren, one of whom is my great grandchild. It was around this time that my wife and I decided it was time for me to leave home and live in an assistant living component of that nursing home. We decided I should live at Livewell. I was fairly close to our home and offered a very progressive program. I now have been living there for three years. And while there are many restrictions, especially during the COVID-19 period, I do live, I do find Livewell to be very supportive in as many ways as they are permitted to do so. For instance, with support from two staff members, we developed the different components of what eventually would become the Dementia Peer Coalition, DPC. The Dementia Peer Coalition is a group of resilient people in Connecticut who are living with the changes attributed to various forms of dementia. The DPC is the independent voice of people living with dementia, run by and for people living well with dementia. Prior to COVID-19, the DPC had seven support groups run by persons living well with dementia. The groups were structured to make certain that each person had an opportunity to speak. At the time, there were 30 members interested in participating in our support groups with an average of 25 participating on a monthly basis. Since COVID, we've had to cancel all face-to-face -face support groups. We then created one COVID support group made up of persons living well with dementia along with their partners. We, are, we hold them twice a month with an average of 25 persons participating each time. In addition, we experiment how to redesign our support groups to be held via Zoom meetings. DPC also creates opportunities for peers living with dementia to support and empower one another in four areas, peer support, advocacy, community education, research, and volunteerism. My partners of the DPC, as a result of our empowerment in our peer-to-peer -peer support groups, have been involved in advocacy efforts before our federal and state legislators, awareness rising, events like To Whom I May Concern, co-leading dementia friend session, and co-presenting at national conferences like Leading Age and Alzheimer's Disease International. However, we also like to simply hang out as a group and enjoy each other's company. Since COVID-19, however, all our DPC families are held via Zoom, FaceTime, and WhatsApp. We are steadily learning how to be comfortable meeting this way, but we can hardly wait until we return to our past face-to-face -face meetings. Today, our Dementia Peer Coalition, DPC, is recognized by the state of Connecticut to be fully and fully operational cooperation. We will soon be submitting our 501c application to the IRS, and then we will be able to accept donations that are tax-free. We will also be able to work under LiveWell's 501c3 during the time that we are waiting for approval from the IRS. I'm privileged to be the president of the board of directors, as well as the executive director. I thank you for this opportunity to share my story.